Praise be to God, my dear friends. I want to tell you that we love you very much. Father Clay Hunt here, the cowboy priest. And it's a cold night in Texas, going down to 17 degrees, it said. But we find our warmth by the light of Christ, by the fire of the Lord. We find our warmth, our strength, our consolation in these dark and cold times that are more than just what we feel from the natural order. These are dark times. And that's why I want to share with you wisdoms from the liturgy in these days and to give you teaching to truth. Because in fact, as the Lord himself said, that is what will set us free. The truth sets us free. And it's necessary for us to know those things, especially in these times of untruth. And we'll see that in the liturgy. People of the world prefer to, to live and to move in untruth. But the children of God are made to be in the light and in the fullness of truth. That's our safety. That's our refuge. So we're going to speak to some of those things today. And I want to go back to the liturgy from the Holy Mass from this past Friday. So that was already a few days ago. As you may may know today is monday the day after the lord's favorite football team that's the dallas cowboys they got beat down by the green bay packers that was ugly <laughs> oh, that was ugly but i told the lord well we remain in the desert lord it's already been 26 years 20, 27 years since we were at the promised land, the Super Bowl. And uh, I told the Lord, maybe we don't have to go 40, Lord. It's up to you, though. But even I was talking to a friend of mine, and we both love the Cowboys. I was talking to him today. And I said, you know, these things are, you know, important for us. Fun things in life. And, and they're they're important things, but... They're absolutely trivial compared to the big game that we're competing in. And that's the faith. And that's why we have to know, know the faith very deeply. And to understand the wisdoms of the Lord and to be forever very cautious with the world. And especially now, the world is pushing so hard against the people of God. So let's go into it. This is from last Friday. The first Friday of ordinary time as celebrated in the Nova Sordo. It was from the first book of the prophet Samuel. All the elders of Israel came in a body to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Now that you are old and your sons do not follow your example, appoint a king over us as other nations have to judge us. You see, the people were desiring, they, they made a multiplicity of mistakes there just because Samuel was old or because uh, they said, and your sons do not listen to you anymore. That's in a large way that it is to the church right now. you know, Or you might say to priests, there's a lot, the vast majority of priests of our time are already advanced in age. I don't know what the percentage is, but there's a lot of older priests. And it's true, we shouldn't listen to many of them because 
They are not true servants of the Lord. But there are many holy priests. And it doesn't matter if they're old. You know, a lot of a lot of foolish people in this time, you know, they say, Well, it's not interesting, you know, the, the priest is old and he's not he's not interesting to our children. We have to be deeper than just shallow. We're not shallow people. What determines our life to God is the covenant. And that's why people need to know that. Yeah, it's nice if we have, you know, other peripheral bonuses, you know. For example, if a priest a priest preaches with substance, you know, and is is attractive to listen to. But it's not always like that. In fact, it's frequent, I would say, in these times. <laughs> It's it's uh, almost a, a burden to listen to many priests in this time uh, because they lack in zeal to the Lord. They many of them are not faithful to the Lord themselves, and therefore they do not have the spark of light. And people are able to to recognize that, and so they're not attracted. But we have to be deeper than that. We have to realize that our life to God absolutely hinges upon the covenant, regardless of the other peripheral things, important as they may be. You know, some people say music and this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I become very irritated to people in that way. You know, like in San Antonio, there's there's many, many people who go to, you know, some kind of mega church there. You know, and they have some motivational speaker there and entertained by lights and effects and music. That is not what worship and fidelity to God is. Yes, we want to be inspired. Yes, there is place for different things. But that is not the source of what defines relationship to God. And in fact... That is far from relationship to God. No matter what the sentiment of the person is. There are many, many, many people. Who are deceived. To be separated from the covenant to God. That's the Eucharist. Because of these, you know, shallow things. And many people lose eternal life for that. That's why. It is important for you to understand, for you to be able to negotiate for your own salvation by being faithful to God, going to the Holy Mass, even if you have to endure. In many cases, the best situation, a boring priest, a, a less than, you know, desirable person to listen to, even if you have to endure those things, much less a priest who is poisoned or who is poison, in fact, to the people. But you have to be able to differentiate, to separate those things. And even if you have to endure, let's say a heretic, you, can, you have every freedom to tell that priest to his face, we're here for the Holy Mass, Father, but you, you're leading people in the wrong way. You are going to be accountable to the Lord. You have every freedom to tell him after every Mass. You know, I told you many times, I hope you go to the daily Mass. You can stand there waiting by the door and tell him, Again, Father, you're in trouble to God. You're a false prophet. You can say like that. And after the Sunday Mass, you can wait out there singularly as an individual person or in groups. You know, and to say, Father, you were wrong on this and this and this. Those are against the teaching of the faith. And let it... Let it stand up to the priests if they're in error. And encourage them if they hold to the plumb line of the deposit of faith. As some people call it. And that's true. We don't deviate from the deposit of faith. We don't deviate from the teachings of the apostles. We don't deviate... To that which was given to us by revelation from the Lord. And these times are tremendous times. There's a lot of deviation from the truth. These are wicked times. As, as I have said to you 
countless times before, surpassing to any other time in the history of humanity. But you have to recognize that these truths that are eternal and enduring are your greatest possession. And you must be able to wield the two-edged sword of the Word of God and to wield it effectively, to challenge and admonish and to instruct and encourage by this greatest of inheritance that we have. And I hope that you pay heed to this mandate from the Lord. Not that I am any person to to teach my own way. I'm simply teaching what Samuel himself, the prophet, taught. And every faithful person from that time till now has taken hold of and handed on from time immemorial. The unchanging, enduring, brilliant truth of the Lord. And in the darkness of these times, we need that light. We do not have the freedom like these foolish people in the time of the prophet Samuel to say like that, you know. Now that you are old and your sons do not follow your example, appoint for us a king. Appoint a king over us as other nations have, you see. That's a very bad thing for the people of God to desire to imitate peoples who are foreign to God. That's going to be a losing formula every single time. And that is, in fact, the greatest assault against us now. From without and from within. From without the church, meaning from the world, and even, unbelievably, from within the church. That's why we got to be sharp. That's why we got to be real sharp. Samuel, rightfully so, it's, Samuel was displeased when they asked for a king to judge them. Rightfully so. He recognized that ain't good on your part, people. You're not doing the right thing, people. He prayed to the Lord. God bless the Holy Samuel. However, the Lord said in answer, grant the people's every request. Because sometimes the Lord's like, if you want to do like that, have at it. Because what is required of us, you see, the Lord loves us. But love requires freedom. That's why the Lord cannot force us. That's human free will. Love has to be responded to reciprocally with love. Otherwise, there's no such thing. So the Lord said, let those people have their own requests. It is not you they reject, the Lord said. They're rejecting me as their king. And that don't go good for a people. Not then and not now. And that's exactly what's happening in our time. People prefer the Lord, the world to the Lord. People prefer to, to live by the ways of the world than by the ways of the Lord. And so the Lord has allowed us to go our own way to the destruction that is coming to its full maturity upon us. Tremendous suffering to God's people for the infidelities of our time to the Lord. So Samuel delivered the message of the Lord in full to those who were asking him for a king. He told them, the rights of the king who will rule you will be as follows. And this is the same to us. Listen to the consequences that come to us when we reject the Lord. And put the ways and those who belong to the world to rule over us. He will take your sons 
and assigned them to his chariots and horses, like to fight his own fights. And the kings of the world, they don't belong to the Lord. So we're fighting for something that is in opposition to the Lord. And this king does not have any concern or care for the lives of your sons. And they will run before his chariot to the loss of their life. He will also appoint from among them his commanders of groups of a thousand and of a hundred soldiers. Because the world orders things in its own way, not by the order of the Lord, not by the structure of the Lord, not by the blueprint of the Lord. The world has its own ways. And those who live according to the dictates of the spirit of the world are separated from the ways of the Lord. He will also set them to do his plowing and his harvesting and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. So that the rulers of the world put your sons to do works and to fight battles that are not of the Lord. So you lose your sons to the world and to the rulers of the world. He will use your daughters as ointment makers, as cooks, and as bakers. So he will enslave your daughters, you know, to menial things. Not done with love. This is a perfect definition of a socialistic society, a communistic society. That's how they operate. Allotting to the people only menial ways of life. Enslaving people. And that's what wants to take our country. The Biden administration, that dude's a straight up Marxist. Obama, Hillary, we just celebrated recently the feast of Saint Hillary. <laughs> he was a great man. His name was Hillary. But the Hillary of our times that you know, what a wicked woman, tremendously wicked woman, knowing nothing to God, absolutely belonging to the world and to the prince of this world and setting up or desiring to set up as Obama himself said, something fundamentally different than the institution of our country of the United States of America. Because they neither know God nor do they, do they know anything or care anything to truth or to the common good. Look at every single country in the history of the world who has embraced those ideologies. Without exception, it leads to tremendous suffering on the people. Most pointedly and, and close to my heart are the beautiful people of Mexico. I'm a Mexican in my heart. In mi corazón soy yo, mexicano. Y me fui a crecer con la gente de México. Son ellos los in my opinion, los mejores en todo el mundo. I believe that the Mexican people are the most substantially good and beautiful people in the whole world, but they have long, century plus, been oppressed by these ideologies that have enslaved such a talented, intelligent, capable, and faithful people. They suffer because of that, as all peoples do, who freely give themselves into be judged by these kind of kings. He 
He will use your daughters for these things. He will take the best of your fields, vineyards, and olive groves and give them to his officials. How does that governor from California say? What a jerk. That guy's a jerk, man. You know, he proposes you will own nothing you know, and it will be good for you. That's how these kind of people think. They're crazy. Absolutely contrary to the vision of freedom and liberty of our founding fathers and to what this country has offered to build into the greatest nation, prosperous and free and opportunistic for the people. Or meaning to say that there is the opportunity for those who apply themselves and work hard. The American way. They want to destroy that. The same spirit that the Israelites, the people of God, freely brought upon themselves. That's We're making the same mistake. We want to be like other nations. We want to be like this. We want to follow these ways. How ridiculous, oh stupid and foolish people, as the Lord Jesus himself said from his own mouth, rightfully so, Lord, do you make that accusation against us, oh stupid and foolish people. He will tithe your crops and your vineyards and give the revenue to his eunuchs. And to his slaves. He will take your male and female servants as well as your best oxen and your asses. When it, whenever we put the government as Lord, it becomes tremendously oppressive to the people. Look at Russia. Look at China. Look at Venezuela. Unbelievable suffering. Why do you think they want to come to the United States? Look at different countries in Africa, not only oppressed by poverty, but by these ideologies. Wicked. He will tithe your flocks and you yourselves will become slaves. When this takes place, you will complain against the king whom you have chosen. But on that day, the Lord will not answer you. You see, the Lord allows us to experience the suffering of our own foolishness. The people, however, see this is stiff-necked people, as Jesus said in his time, far later after Samuel, far separated from the time of Samuel, but the same sentiment. Jesus said, you stiff-necked people. Why? They refused to listen to Samuel's warning and they said, not so. There must be a king over us. We too must be like other nations. Why do you want to look there and be like people who do not know anything, who do not believe anything to God? Oh, stupid and foolish people. You desire for the kings of this world to rule over you and to lead you into warfare and to fight your battles. But you will lose everything by not following the Lord. And when Samuel had listened to all the people and what they had to say, he repeated it to the Lord who then said to him, grant their request and appoint a king to rule them. Let them have it. But to us, we follow the Lord. We make it our business to follow in the way of the Lord. As the psalmist said, forever I will sing of your goodness, Lord. I choose to, to follow to, to the Lord. And I hope you do as well. For, as the Gospel Antiphon said, a great prophet has arisen in our midst and God has visited his people. That's why we follow Jesus Christ. That's why we call him the light of the world. He is the only way. As we say, the way, the truth, 
and the life. And listen to this account from the Holy Gospel of St. Mark. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, after some days it became known that he was at home. And many gathered there together, so that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door. So everyone wanted to be close to Jesus as they were hearing. And as reports were going around how powerful he was teaching. It's beautiful to follow a powerful teacher of the truth. And that's why we long for that. And that's why we hunger for that. And that is Christ. He is the truth. His word is the truth. And many people gathered together so that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door. And he preached the word to them. How beautiful the lips who zealously preach the truth of the Lord. And they came bringing to him a paralytic. Carried by four men. Unable to get close or near to Jesus because of the crowd. I love the, the tenacity of these four men who carried their brother, the paralytic. Because they loved him. And they desired for him to be healed. And this is a critical teaching lesson that our Lord Jesus Christ made. I want you to listen closely and to understand. So he saw the faith of these men who were unable to get near to Jesus because of the crowd. They opened up the roof above him. And after they had broken through, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to him to the paralytic child your sins are forgiven that's beautiful your sins are forgiven that's the greatest healing the healing to the soul they desired for him a physical healing which is good in itself but by far surpassing exponentially more important and more beneficial is the healing of the soul. So Jesus says to this man, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there asking themselves, you see, these are religious leaders of that time, scholars of the law and leaders of the people and the ways of the faith. There have always been numbered among them, among religious leaders, wicked persons, unknowing to God and uncaring to God's people. That's why Jesus accused them. And that's why they're looking to undermine the work of Jesus. So they were afraid of him as they are because they ain't no men. They're weak men. So they weren't challenging to Jesus outright, but they were saying to themselves, Why does, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who but God alone can forgive sins? And that's true, but they weren't thinking of God. They were thinking of themselves. They were already seduced by power, greed, lust, and every other kind of foul thing of the spirit of the world. They belong to the world. That's why they did not recognize Jesus. And that's why they hated him. And eventually killed him on the cross. Foolish, wicked men. Imposters to the house of the Lord. And there are many of those in our own time. But the Lord knew their thoughts. Jesus immediately knew in his mind what they were thinking to themselves. So he said, <laughs> God bless the Lord. We love the Lord big time. So he said, why are you thinking such things in your hearts? See, they didn't say it out loud. Scared and frightful about everything. Afraid of their own shadow, many of them. That's why Father Clay says all the time, I'll drag those dudes all over the place. 
They got it coming one way or another. One way or another, they got it coming. Jesus asks, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, pick up your mat and walk. So naturally, these scribes were left speechless. They couldn't say anything because they had just recognized in their own hearts who alone but God can forgive sins. And then on the other side of the coin, who's going to be able to say to this paralytic who's been like that his whole life, legs withered, weak body, you know, unable to stand on his own or walk. Who's going to be able to say to him, rise, pick up your mat and go home. So either way, they were dumbfounded. Jesus said, but did you may know that the son of man has authority to forgive sins on earth? He said to the paralytic. I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man rose, picked up his mat at once, and went away in the sight of everyone. They were all astounded and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Beautiful. Praise be to God. And that's why I tell to you, that's why I tell to you in our time. And it's true that we desire like for our loved ones to be healed from cancer. To be healed from all the ailments and difficulties that life could present. We desire for the good of our loved ones. But we have to know and to be solicitous to the greater healing. And that's the sacramental life of Holy Mother Church. And most pointedly, the Holy Confession. And equally powerful, the Holy Anointing. Both healing sacraments. And we have to do that for ourselves, for our children, for our families, for our loved ones. To try to talk sense and not just one time. You know, if if one of my uh, brothers went out of the church and started going to one of those, uh, uh, you know, mega churches, I would tell him straight up, and this is absolutely true. I would tell him, brother, you know, I love you. We grew up together. We're brothers. But get your, get your face out of my face. I don't want to see you until you humble yourself and turn back to the Lord for yourself, for your children, for, for good. Until you stop this foolishness, I have nothing to do with you. I would tell that to my brother, my cousin, to anyone, and especially to my family. Because those are the most serious things. Eternal life. The, our life to God. You know, what, what benefit is it to gather together, you know, with the presumption that everything's okay when it, it's absolutely not. And I know that it's not. And the Lord has said that it's not. He was the one who said, Amen, I say to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I don't know you. Regardless of what the human person th thinks, like those scribes or many other people, the Lord don't put up with the foolishness of the thoughts of humanity, of men and women, regardless of their insistence to believe that they're in right thinking. That's the fool that's what defines foolishness to a human person. And what defines wisdom to a human person is to humbly submit to the things that were revealed to us by the Lord, the truth. 
That's what defines to wisdom, even at the consequence of hardship. And that's why I tell you, yeah, it ain't right. If you live in San Antonio, fine. You hear this jack wagon priest over there, you know, saying BS. You hear some young whippersnapper that thinks he's intelligent saying this, that, or the other thing that doesn't measure up by whatever degree, by a little degree off, or by a lot of degree off. You can dismiss them, as I told you, and challenge them, as I told you. But you don't have the freedom to turn your back to the only one who heals us, and that's the Lord. If you're in San Antonio or... Houston, or Lord have mercy, Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> you can go around looking for a priest that offers mass that is inspiring to you. That is able to say something inspiring to you. Hopefully a priest who is eloquent and in line to truth, not just eloquent in line to truth and that is beneficial for you and your family but it, not everyone has that it's not that easy sometimes sometimes in towns there's only one priest and sometimes he ain't a good one so it ain't that easy but you cannot allow it to separate you from the only one who heals us and that's the Lord and even if you have to swallow that nasty bad tasting medicine meaning the poverty of the humanity of the church you cannot forego the healing benefits of her divinity because that is what defines to salvation and that's what defines to grace i hope that you can understand these things and that you can Openly and fully surrender yourself anew to the Lord in these ridiculous times. As our Blessed Mother said on multiple occasions, souls in this time are falling into hell like snowflakes. That ain't okay. That's why we fight. That's why I tell you again and again. And I prayed the my favorite office of the liturgy of the hours this morning the office of readings and we take consolation and strength anew to face each day with these beautiful words from the psalmist psalm 31 in you lord i take refuge let me never be put to shame in your justice Set me free, hear me, and speedily rescue me. Be a rock of refuge for me, a mighty stronghold to save me. For you are my rock, my stronghold. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Release me from the snares that they have hidden. You know yourself, Lord, the wickedness of the men of this world and the surpassing wickedness of those men whom you have called to lead your people in the ways of the faith, in the ways of the covenant, the ways of the covenant. But when these men go astray, they are the most insidious, the most dangerous, the most harmful, the most destructive, the most wicked. Release us, Lord from the snares that they have hidden. For you are my refuge, Lord. Into your hands I commend my spirit. It is you who will redeem us, Lord, you alone. O God of truth, you detest those who worship false and empty gods like these wicked persons of our time who are trying to bamboozle the people of God, encouraging immorality and perversion even to to the unspeakable degrees that they are this is a wicked time 
saying that it's okay to bless, you know, that, that God blesses sodomy. We have arrived to a critical time. As for me, I trust the Lord. Let me be glad and rejoice in your love. You who have seen my affliction and taken heed of my soul's distress have not handed me over to the enemy, but set my feet at large. I want to tell you in reference to that insidious document that was released from Rome. I was listening to some priest. I don't even know where he was from. And he put himself, you know, he was a young priest, probably, well, I say young, maybe my age, maybe a little younger. And he was given a homily. It was, I think, on the Feast of the Holy Family. So it was right after Christmas. What an arrogant blowhard, I would like to call him. You know, and he was saying that he studied this document and he was saying there's nothing against the faith and he was quoting things that are true to the faith. Absolutely. There are many truths, but they're twisted. That's what becomes the most dangerous. If something was obviously in opposition to the faith, we recognize that we stay far away from it. The most insidious thing is that which looks most like the truth. Because it looks good to us. That's how the, the enemy deceived the woman and the man from the beginning. What did it say when she looked at the fruit? It looked good, like it would be healthy for her. It looked desirable. It looked like it would be beneficial. So she took and ate from the fruit. And so did the man. And that's exactly what is being played out in our time. So there are most insidious snares embedded in many truths that were proposed from that. And that's why when I hear priests like that, you know, dismissing the dangers that are threatening the eternal salvation of God's people in our time, I'd like to slap that dude with a good backhand. And as I've told you many times to, to manhandle that dude in a different way than sodomites manhandle each other. I'm talking about a real cowboy manhandling because that priest, I don't think he's, I think there's something wrong with that priest as I listen to him. But there were people there listening to him and laughing and and following, there will be some, a few, who recognize the insidious dangers that he was speaking of, of what he was saying. But most people are not capable of detecting that danger. And that's why these are unbelievable times. That's why these are... That's my constant cause for anxiety to God's people. The loss of souls. That's why I fret over it. I lose sleep over it. I cry over it. And my resolve, my resolve is never to surrender, never to lose hope. But I see what's happening all around. And it is disconcerting to me. Because I love God's people. I love you. And that's why I encourage you to truth. And that's why I teach you these truths anew. Because truth is by itself. It alone stands. And everything else is in opposition to it. O oh God of truth, you detest those who worship false and empty gods. As for me, I trust in the Lord. Let me be glad and rejoice in your love. You who have seen my affliction and taken heed of my soul's distress, have not handed me over to the enemy, but set my feet at large. We absolutely trust you, Lord, in season and out of season. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am in distress. Tears have wasted my eyes, my throat and my heart. For my life is spent with sorrow 
and my years with sighs. Affliction has broken down my strength and my bones waste away. In the face of all my foes, I am a reproach, an object of scorn to my neighbors and of fear to my friends. You know, and I consider, like I told you, I'm 51 years old, still strong. I was working today. I'm able to, to do the work of a cowboy in many ways. I'm not as strong as I once was. But I'm still strong. But I know. And I, I, there's no way that I can measure the time. I mean, time goes by. It passes quicker all the time. I recognize that. And so that I've been keenly aware of these wickednesses in the world. In the last, you know, six years, ten years. I've always known. I've had a sense but I've become keenly aware, probably in the last, you know, definitely within the last 10 years. How long will this oppression and this hardship last? I have no way of measuring that. Will I live to be an old man as the servant of the Lord, the prophet Samuel? Maybe. Will I see with my own eyes uh, the liberation of the bride of Christ from these wicked things of the world? I hope so. I always, every day I hope, I tell the Lord, let it be today. But I have no way of knowing that. I have no uh, appointed time in the future that I say we can just make it to that day. And that's why I, I recognize that my body and my mind loses strength little by, little by little with each passing day with the years that pass by. I don't know when the master will return to put his house in order. But I, the one thing I, I do have control over is to be steadfast and vigilant and faithful to my part as I can be. And that's exactly what my intentions are. This little cowboy has every intention to die with his boots on. And to, until my last breath, be about the work of salvation of souls. Of proclaiming the truth. That's my intention. Those who see me in the street, the psalmist said, run far away from me. I am like a dead man forgotten, like a thing thrown away. I have heard the slander of the crowd, fear is all around me as they plot together against me, as they plan to take my life. Whatever. I ain't afraid of any of those guys. But there's a lot of priests who are getting whacked. And they ain't cowboys. That's sad. There's a lot of priests who are unable to measure up, you know, as men to these plots of wicked men. And that's sad. I hope in some way you can be sharp to these things and understand and to be as su supportive as you can to any priest who is faithful to God. But as for me, I trust in the Lord. I say you are my God. My life is in your hand. Deliver me from the hands of those who hate me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your love. These words are from the psalmist today. Monday, January the 15th. And that's why I want you to pray these with your own mouth. That you can have the grace and strength to persevere in the grace of the Lord, that you may draw ever nearer to the Lord. How great is the goodness of the Lord that you keep for those who fear you, that you show to those who trust you in the sight of men. How many people do I know in this world who struggle like parents or grandparents or cousins or brothers and sisters from this insidious 
abomination to God of homosexual, you know, activity on the part of family members and now undermined by this confusion even from those within the church to say, oh, it's a blessing, you can be blessed like that. How many people do I know who are absolutely in distress over all these things? Out of love for God and out of love for their family. And there are many who are undermined and surrender to the world to say, well, I guess it's okay if this priest said it's okay, if this bishop said it's okay, then it must be okay. So we'll surrender to that. We never surrender to the, to the truth. We never surrender to, un, to be against the truth is what I'm saying. What is true to God. Homosexual relations are never in the blessing of God. And they, they make a play on words and twist words. That's a classic Marxist technique. There was no need to write any document. The church always blesses a repentant sinner or a person who comes, you know, asking for God's grace to, to escape from sin. That's always the case. But these wicked persons have intentionally caused confusion in order to lead many astray. And in fact, many are being led astray. But that's why I encourage you by the words of the psalmist to take care of those, Lord. I encourage you to trust to the Lord that the Lord, in fact, may uphold you. How great is the goodness of the Lord that you keep for those who fear you. That you may be the one to fear the Lord. To keep to His truth. And to reject the lies of the world. That you may show to those who trust you in the sight of men. That you're not afraid of any man or any person. Or consequence of being rejected by any person. Of course we love our family. That's true. If... If I have a homosexual person, I remember there's, I have a, a cousin who's homosexual. He's almost going to pass from this world. He's an old man already. But years ago, and even almost 30 years ago, one time I was passing through where he was and I went and stayed with him. And I became aware of these bad behaviors and I told him, it's not okay for you to live like that. And ever since then, he hated me. That's all right. I still love him. In fact, I'm praying for him every day right now as he is nearing to death. And I hope that he will be the one to die in the grace of the sacraments. I hope that he will be able to repent and to turn his face to God. Because those are tremendous offenses, unacceptable to the Lord. Those things are not that easy. Those things are not that easy to do. But we fear the Lord above any other person. And we trust to the Lord even despite the thoughts of any other person. Lord, hide them in the shelter of your presence. I pray that for you who have to face these challenges in your own life and in your own family. That God may give you strength. Hide them, Lord, in the shelter of your presence from the plotting of men. Keep them safe in your tent from disputing tongues. Blessed be the Lord who shows me the wonders of his love in a fortified city. That's a beautiful statement. That we put ourselves to be faithful to God, that he may shelter us in a fortified city. I am far removed from your sight, I said in my alarm, yet you heard the voice of my, my pleading when I cried to you for help. Lord, bless your people. Send grace to your people. Oh, Lord God, that's what I call the Holy Spirit, the Lord himself. Lord, come and renew the face of the earth. Come, Holy Spirit. Love the Lord, all you his saints. 
and what it means to love the Lord. He said, if you want to follow me, if you want to be with me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You don't make your own ways against the ways of the Lord. That's a deception. You embrace a path of deception and you will lose your place to God. That's why even if we have wicked intentions, we have to pray, deny ourselves, not just give ourselves wholeheartedly and try to justify it. Crazy people, crazy. But the Lord will repay to the full those who act with pride. <laughs> They even call themselves pride. The pride movement. The Lord will repay to the full those who act with pride. And again, I've told you before, even more offensive to God is the sin of wicked shepherds. So in the church, there are sodomite men and those who, who give, uh, give themselves into the false ideology that, that they are charitable when they encourage and, and do not admonish the sodomite. They see themselves as being charitable. It's a lie, not charitable at all. Truth is charity and truth has to be given in love, but in truth. So the one who encourages and opens the door to the sinner, even if that sinner is a sodomite, is more offensive to God than the sinner himself. The one who opens the the doorway to sin for the sinner. And that's a lot of these guys that I'm talking about who have abdicated their responsibility as the Lord himself would call them hired hands. Or as the Lord himself would call them blind leaders of the blind. How does it say about them? The Lord will repay to the full those who act with pride. But the encouragement of the psalmist, be strong and let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. I hope that's you. I love you very much. I know these times are hard. That's why I give you these encouragements. And I pray for you daily. I pray for God's people. I never miss the Holy Mass, not even one single day. When I hear a priest take off a day from Mass, I'm like, what the heck kind of guy are you? What the heck kind of guy are you? That's the, the number one, the only, the first responsibility of a priest. If he ain't doing that, he ain't worth his weight. And believe me, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying most priests do not, in our time, celebrate the Holy Mass every day. They take a day off. What a bunch of jerks. What a bunch of worthless. You know, I, I was just with a friend of mine. And he said, uh, <laughs> well, he said something worthless. We're going to give you the blessing. The Lord be with you. And in this winter time, may you draw strength from the light and from the fire of the Lord. May he keep you warm and safe. And may he give you every grace to be faithful in this faithless time. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Adios. Bye.